This is my, uh, can you guys all hear me okay? At the back? No? Should I use this? Okay. All right, is this better? Uh oh. <laughs> like, I'm not going very far. I'm tethered. Um, yeah, so thanks for the wonderful introduction. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm here today to talk about wading through mud, um, especially in specifically in Agile. So um, before I get started, this is where I currently live. Um, not a lot of people realize how big the US is, but I'm not originally from there. I'm actually from one of these places that's smaller, much smaller, obviously. No, I'm joking. I found this on the internet, um, and Americans do like to think that their country is enormous. Um, I digress. So what I want to talk about is the mud that is slowing us down when we're trying to deliver software quickly. These days, or at least probably the last 10 years, everyone's asking to be agile. And a lot of organizations that I go into as a consultant, they are telling me that they're already agile, and they've already introduced lots of agile processes. In the last sort of five years, people have been asking for continuous delivery and DevOps. Um, or now they want to be lean. But the problem is, is that no matter what processes they seem to implement, they can't seem to go any faster. What they're really asking for, or what people are asking for when they ask for things like continuous delivery, or DevOps, or Agile, is the ability to get all of these pieces into production reliably, safely, without breaking everything. And they want stuff to work, like Uncle Bob said. The thing is, is when you ask for something like continuous delivery as an example, it's not just about spinning up environments or managing your data, or configuration management. In order to do any of that, you also have to be able to do continuous integration, and you actually have to have some tests that run in your CI server, which means you have to think about quality assurance. And actually, if you have a great big monolithic app that you want to be able to deploy through all of this, if it's huge and it's hard to test and you haven't thought about all these things in the first place, i.e. like how you designed it and the architecture, you're not going to be able to do anything by just implementing Puppet or Chef or Ansible. You won't actually Go any faster. Because the mud that I'm going to talk about today is the mud that's in your architecture. And specifically, the ball of mud pattern, which is the most common software architectural pattern that there actually is. Um, there was a paper written on it, it's worth reading. And the ball of mud architecture was created by expediency over design. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Move faster rather than design? So, why are we here? Well, this is actually a real architectural diagram from a client. I will not mention any names. I don't want to embarrass anyone. Um, but this client specifically wanted to do continuous delivery. And after a couple of months, literally said, where is my continuous delivery? And I said, well, the problem is this. There are about 100 of these. Just to build it, you had to do it overnight and rebuild it three times just to make sure that all the dependencies had hooked up. And that's not even writing any tests. Then they threw it over the wall to a team in India who then spent several weeks testing it. And he wanted to be able to deploy faster in an automated fashion. And I said, you're not going to be able to do anything with this. This is your problem. Now, when I uh, was digging around and trying to understand this and trying to figure out you know, how this had happened, and there were so many different cyclic dependencies there, one of the things I had to do was get the buy-in of the enterprise architects to make any changes, because we had to make changes in order to deploy faster. And I said, how did this happen? And they said, well, we didn't design it like that. <laughs> no, no shit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they blamed the programmers for making it like that. What was interesting is that they trained the programmers to do this, right? They said to programmers, they built a code generation tool to enable the programmers to move faster, which meant none of the programmers on their team really understood the architecture of the system. And so the idea was is that they were supposed to build these vertical slices all the way through the system. And in order to write any code, they basically wrote a store procedure and then generated code all the way to the top. So the only real code in the system was in the store procedures and in the JavaScript. And what they'd done is they'd trained the programmers to never think about dependencies. But 
programmers bounce around different organizations, and over time, they eventually started creating dependencies that they weren't supposed to, without having any design in mind and without thinking about it. So unsurprisingly, within about five years, they had this. So what's missing, and what caused that problem other than those crazy architects with their crazy ideas? Um, well, let's start with the Agile movement. The idea of being Agile, little a, not the big A, not the noun, is to be able to move quickly and easier. And that's why we're all here today. We want to be able to move quicker and easier. And most organizations that start on their Agile journey start with this level one here at the start. What they do is they're trying to get the teams focused on value. So rather than spending a long time writing specifications for things that may or may not never get built in several years' time, we all need to move faster. So let's, you, let's implement Scrum. Let's get the teams to focus on the biggest priority first, which is great. That's great. You're focused on value. But that usually is as far as anyone gets. Now, Diana Larson and James Shaw in 2012 created this great model, which is the Agile Fluency model. And this describes how you become really agile, little a, in an organization. And the first thing you have to do, the first thing everyone does, is you have to change the culture. You have to get people thinking about the priorities and what's important and what value we want to deliver. And cultural change is hard and getting people to change their mindset is hard. But at the end of the day, most teams can usually adopt some sort of agile practices in this way within a couple of months. It's not that hard to learn to do a stand-up, although I have seen 45-minute stand-ups before, but I won't go there. Um, <laughs> it's not that hard to learn to do a retrospective, and it's not that hard to learn to plan on a two-week basis or a one-week basis than it is for a year. In fact, it's easier to plan over the short term. But what is hard is learning new skills which is what level two is, where you actually are able to deliver value more quickly and more easily. You actually have to learn new skills. Now, most teams I've seen, I think it's something like 47%, I, I got that number off the internet, so it may or may not be true, um, are stuck in the first stage. And about 30%, which I feel like it's less, but I'm also a consultant, so most of the organizations I go into are at level one, are about 30%. But what are those practices? Well, those are some of the disciplined technical practices that Uncle Bob was talking about earlier. That's things like learning to write tests. That's things like pair programming and designing your code. Because in Agile, we do, do, we do do code design, we do do architectural design. We do it together as a group. Sometimes we do it in a pair, and sometimes we might pull, it, pull apart into a smaller subset to think about the decisions that we're making. But there is design that needs to get done, and you need to have that discipline. And if you don't adopt some practices like that, and refactoring is another one, you will never move past stage one. The challenge is, is those things are really hard. So how did we get here? Well, let's take us back to the 90s and see where we were as an industry. And I talked to Martin Fowler, who was another one of the signees of the Agile Manifesto, and I asked him for a bit of a history lesson on, you know, why don't we do XP and why does everyone do Scrum? And I just assumed it was because Scrum was first. But anyway, Uncle Bob took us to uh, the 1930s and 1940s. I'm going to take us to the 90s because that's not quite when I was learning to program because I was still at school, but it was when I was playing computer games, more specifically Lemmings. Anyone play Lemmings? Yes. This is when I learned that computer games are extremely dangerous and addictive. Uh, <laughs> My mum used to have to drag us away at, to eat and to sleep while me and my brothers continuously played lemmings. And I often use lemmings as a metaphor for architecture um, because when you, or at least uh, even your path as maturity as a developer, because when you start playing lemmings, you're terrible and they all die. But very quickly you realize that what you need to do is, first thing you need to do is stop them from dying and then you need to figure out what's the strategy to get them to where they need to go. So this is the idea of like, what's the most important thing to do? Let's fix that first. And let's figure out 
you know, the, the, the decisions we have to make now versus later. And then the next thing is thinking about well, what are the decisions that we care about and what's the strategy and what's the best strategy for getting there. Anyway, I digress, but Lemmings was fun and very addictive. But where were we as an industry? Well, Scrum was not the first, actually. I assumed it was, but it wasn't. Um, apparently, Waterfall and Scrum and XP got designed all around the same time. And actually, uh, the prominent programming practice before those, in terms of development methodologies, was actually chaos. <laughs> um, that's full on cowboy coding, doing whatever you want. And then as these management teams were trying to deliver business value, they wanted to get their arms around that. So they created this huge process called Waterfall to keep the programmers in line, which was great. And you'll notice Waterfall also includes no technical practices. So what happened was the Agile community, it wasn't really the Agile community then, but the development community, people like Kent Beck and Ken Schwerber and others in that space, rebelled against the idea of waterfall and said, here, there's another option. There's a more disciplined, more iterative practice that we could do. And Scrum was great, right? We've, I think most of us are doing or have done some version of this, which is let's prioritize what we need to get done and let's go and do it. And our Scrum did actually say you should implement some kind of technical practice, but it didn't explicitly say which ones you should implement. On the other hand, XP did. XP said, here's a bunch of practices that you will need to implement in order to move faster continuously and build quality software and release reliably. And a lot of the similar stuff was in there as Scrum, things like small releases and planning games and getting the whole team together. But it also had this other fun, somewhat harder stuff. Well, actually, code ownership, that's not that hard. You could also, as a team, own the whole code as opposed to just one person. And coding standards, you know, sometimes it can be a bit of a fight to the death. But once you've made a decision, you can stick to it. It's not that hard. But things like test-driven development, refactoring, simple design, pair programming, continuous integration, those are a little harder to learn and they require much more discipline. However, if you don't do them, you will end up with a ball of mud. And who has balls of mud in their architecture now? The answer is everybody. I have literally not seen a piece of software that isn't some ball of mud somewhere. Usually it's in the payment system because nobody ever wants to touch it in case it breaks. I, w I was once working at an organization where every I was a .NET developer, C Sharp, um, and everything, <laughs> everything in the architecture was in C Sharp, except for the payment system, which was in VB8, because nobody wanted to touch it. So I'm just going to do a little reminder of what these technical practices are and talk about how we can actually tackle these balls of mud that are fundamentally the thing that's slowing us down. It's not, it's not the prioritization, it's not the stand-up, unless it's 45 minutes long and then that will slow you down. Um, it's not doing these. So we'll start with the most controversial and probably the most difficult to learn if you've not been doing TDD your whole career, which is test-driven development. I mean, it's, fundamentally, it's not that hard, right? You go and sit down to write a piece of code and you think about what the conditions that you need to meet. And then instead of immediately start typing away, writing up all the conditions, all the case statements and if statements you can possibly think of, you actually stop and go, okay, what's the first test? And then you write that test and it should fail. And then you write that condition and the test should pass. And then you go back to whatever you didn't know. <laughs> then you think about where you want to refactor. This is the design piece. This is where you and your pair, because pair programming is a part of XP, think about, is there a better way to design that? Now that we've created many of these conditions, is there a pattern that we could implement that would be cleaner and easier to read for our future friends who have to read our code? Because guess what? You read code more than you write it. So when you write it in a horrible way, people hate you. And there's nothing worse than when you go and look at some code and you're like, who wrote this? Oh, it was me. <laughs> um, I'm now like over 10 years into my programming career, so I guess according to Uncle Bob, I'm kind of okay. <laughs> Maybe not terrible. But people 
doesn't push back on TDD. Now, it doesn't help that you get big Ruby enthusiasts like DHH saying TDD is dead. Well, that's easy for him to say after he's practiced it for many years and he really understands it and he has the ability to be pragmatic and say this is a good time to use TDD versus it isn't. But if you've never written tests or test-driven code before, I'm not going to buy that argument because you don't know what you don't know. One of the tricky parts of it is it is hard to learn. It is a discipline change. Instead of just going away and starting hacking away, you actually have to stop and think what are the tests. But I've noticed after sort of three to six months, most people get it. They might still not want to do it, but they get it. But TDD, or not TDD, because some people say, well, I can just write unit tests after the fact. I can write the whole code, I can write all the objects, and then I'll write all the tests. Well, one, that never happens. You, you always just throw it over to some tester to write that test. And the problem with that is you're not creating that. There's two, there's two great things that TDD brings. One is it gives you self-testing code. So when you've finished and you've checked in for the day, because you should be checking in every day, but I'll get to that, everything should have a test. And that's great. When you come back tomorrow, if one of those tests is broken, well, that would be weird. But if it was, it means somebody's broken something and you know exactly where it's broken because it's testing a unit, a specific condition, not the whole end-to-end -end thing. If you go off and let a tester write an end-to-end -end test in Selenium and that breaks, well, that break could be in the JavaScript, the front end. It could be somewhere all the way through the code. It could be in the database. It could be anywhere. It's going to take you a lot, lot, lot longer to find that issue. Um, and that's a problem because our friends in ops, they have this thing called mean time to recovery that they really care about, like how quickly they can find an issue. Well, most of finding an issue, or fixing an issue, I should say, is finding it. Once you find it, you're like, oh, that condition's wrong, change it. Usually the change isn't that hard. It's finding it that's really hard. And actually that issue, I think that night thing that um, Uncle Bob was talking about where they killed the company in 45 minutes. They couldn't find the issue straight away. Definitely did not have tests. So the other great thing that TDD gives you is a nice clean design because it forces you to think in a clean design way, one test at a time, one small step at a time. So it gives you two things, self-testing code and your design is better. In fact, I reckon I can tell whether something has been TDD'd or not because it's so much easier to read. But it's all about confidence. So it's great to have self-testing code. And people ask me, well, how much coverage should I have? Should I have 70% coverage? 80? 90? Is 20 OK? I don't really care about your coverage. I care about your confidence. If it's a critical part of the system, especially if somebody may die, that should have 100% test coverage. If it's a less critical part of your system, maybe it's some form that has something to do with marketing and it's not the biggest deal in your organization, I don't know. But maybe you don't need to put the effort in if you haven't done beforehand. But you need to have confidence where it matters. Now, you've probably all heard of the testing pyramid. What I usually see is something that looks more like a cupcake. Um, <laughs> And really, your goal is, is where you need confidence in your system, it should definitely be a pyramid. It should definitely be majority unit tests. Maybe you'll have some integration and endpoint tests. And maybe you will have one great big test that runs through the whole system that tests the happy path. But the majority of your tests should be in the unit test space. <laughs> that brings me to the second difficult discipline that people are not following. And this one especially will create incredible balls of mud because we often don't write great code the first time. As we're learning and understanding the system, we might go, oh, actually, there's a better way of designing that. But don't then create like a technical deck card and stick it on a wall and somebody picks it up three months later and goes, what's this? <laughs> they won't do it. It doesn't happen. Technical deck uh, story walls and cards are very useful for code that's already written, not code you're writing right now, but code that's already written where you know you're going to have to change it in the future 
And so it gives you a great, <laughs> great radiator of where that code is not great already. Because one of the things about estimation, and I hate estimation and I hate story points and all of that stuff, but that's a different rant for a different day. Um, one of the benefits of estimation is actually the discussion that happens around the complexity of a story, the complexity to implement something. Now, if you're talking about the complexity and you haven't looked at the code, you're only talking about the complexity of your imagined view of how wonderful this story is going to play out in your head, but you have no idea about the state of the code that you're actually going to change. That is not a good thing. You should be looking at that code and going, hmm, we're probably going to need to refactor that before we make any changes. Because turning around and saying, well, we didn't estimate for refactoring, so we're not going to do it, so we're just going to kind of throw some more condition statements into that 3,000 line class. We've all done it. That's not a good thing. And then it just gets worse. So refactoring is often misunderstood. So a couple of heuristics around it. If you've spent several days doing it and your tests have been broken for a while, you're doing it wrong. Um, Refactoring, much like TDD, should be done in small steps. Ideally, as soon as you've written the code, you can quickly figure out if it could be designed better. But if you're going in and look at something that's already existing, you need to refactor it in order to add new code to it. You may spend a while doing what is referred to as scratch refactoring, which is like you're moving around with the code to see what you could do with the design. But you don't then spend like three days doing that and then go, okay, I think it's okay, I'm just gonna check it in. You actually should probably roll all the way back and try and figure out how you do it in small steps so that you can continuously integrate. You don't create enormous merge issues because enormous merge issues detract and deter people from doing refactoring. And if you don't refactor your code, you will end up with a ball of mud. Now, sometimes people are hesitant to refactor because they didn't write the code themselves. They're like, well, that's Bob's code. Well, that's Rachel's code. I don't want to mess with it. This is where another one of the practices of extreme programming comes in, which is code ownership. If only one person owns the code and only one person touches it, then it's not going to get the value of having more eyes looking at it and getting a better design for one. But also, what happens if something that happens to that person? We're in a very, <laughs> very competitive talent market in the software development world at the moment, so assuming that somebody's going to be around forever is probably a bad assumption. So if you're a manager in the room and you're wondering, why should I do pair programming, pay two developers to do one job, well, there's one for you. <laughs> Because if that person leaves, you've got nobody that understands that code. But you also don't have the benefit of having two eyes, four eyes, which are better than two, in improving the code. So what you'll notice about XP is this wasn't written by an idiot, right? All of these things actually all work together in unison. They all help each other and build on top of each other, but they require discipline. The last key one I'm going to talk about is continuous integration. I often get told by people, we're doing continuous integration, we've installed Jenkins. Great. Implementing and installing a tool is not the same as actually having a disciplined practice. The discipline practice of CI is not the tool. There's many great tools for this now, which is awesome, makes our lives easier. But the discipline practice is actually committing to trunk, mainline, whatever you call it, every single day. That is not pulling from mainline every day. It's not the same. I know because I've been burned by this myself. I was using Git Flow. I used to be a fan, not a fan anymore. I was using Git Flow and we all had our little like mini feature branches all over the place. Every, I was pulling every day, but I was doing a very big refactoring. It took me days. But so were some of my teammates. I didn't know that. We weren't talking to each other. We weren't pairing. And then one day, surprisingly enough at the end of the sprint when we all had to check our code in, everyone started pushing to mainline. What do you think happened? Let's just say at the end of the day, the project manager yelled across the team space and said, nobody check in until Rachel's done. Because every time I tried to check in and I pulled again, everything had changed. So this is one of the reasons that we should check in all the time. 
is because the idea of continuous, continuous delivery, Agile and XP, this wire is lethal. Um, <laughs> the idea of these things is to create releasable software regularly, frequently release it that you have confidence in that isn't going to implode your production system or kill anybody. That is the goal. So as a developer, your mindset, your discipline should be, when I check in today, is this code ready to go to production? And if the answer is not, if the answer is no, then you probably shouldn't check in. However, that means that you probably weren't building something that was small enough or in a small enough step to be able to check in. So you need to go all the way back to that practice and look at your TDD practice and your refactoring practice and how small your changes are. They all build on each other to build releasable code. So that's continuous integration, but where does continuous delivery fit in? I love this picture of water scrum fall because this is basically what it is. Um, <laughs> It's like, cool, we made this bit in the middle really fast. It doesn't really have much value if you're still spending years deciding what you're going to do. Um, and then you throw it over the wall to somebody to deploy it and then go, that's not my problem anymore. So obviously continuous delivery and DevOps um, as a cultural movement came about to solve these things towards the end which is great, that's get the developers and operations to work together to solve the problems that they're both responsible for. Operations is responsible for SLAs and uptime. They don't want the system to break because then they get called in the middle of the night. Developers are responsible for getting new things into production. Now if your new things are going to break, <laughs> break production, then the ops people don't want them. They want things that don't break production. And so the idea is that if these teams work together and you're doing agile on one side, so you're building releasable code, then you figure out how do we work together to be able to get that code into production safely. Now some great things popped out the back of that, which is things like tools like Puppet, Chef, and all of these great tools that basically allow ops to write code to determine the state of the system. So you have the same, same confidence, same level of testing as you do in your actual code as you do for your configuration management and for your environments and your deployment. This is how we can all have great software and work wonderfully together. But the idea is that the software is always production ready and that it's actually a business decision to release it or not. In fact, many, many organizations these days, most of the stuff is already in production. Somebody just turns it on. And there's many different techniques around that, whether it's canary releasing or blue-green deployment. But they all come from developers and operations working together to figure out how do they get code changes all the way from development to production as quickly and as safely as possible. So it's clear continuous delivery, DevOps, and many of these things all play together. And there's even more layers that go on top of that in terms of thinking about how you do releases and how you actually structure your organization. And you have to tackle them all to stop having the balls of mud. They all need to be tackled. But that's all great, and you're probably like, cool, okay, Rachel, yeah, I'll do TDD next time, and I'll do refactoring from now on. But as you clearly all admitted, we've all got balls of mud now, so what do we do about the ones we have now? Well, let's talk about technical debt for a moment. Now, I think the most common form of technical debt is you kind of knew that it was there, hopefully, um, but you had a deadline to meet. Um, so you shipped it. Probably not the best thing in the world. There's other types of technical debt, which is where people are just inexperienced, apparently half of us less than five years, um, and we don't even understand the practices or the architecture or anything that's actually been chosen, which is very dangerous. And I like to think of those as one has been prudent, only prudent if you then figure out, if you then fix the technical debt that you've actually created. 
But one is quite reckless, like really, this is where pair programming really helps, is like upskilling other members of the team. These things can also be deliberate or inadvertent. So you deliberately deploy, knowing that there's issues, because you have to. Um, some people say we don't have time for design, which is insane. If we don't have time for design, we might as well just let monkeys do it. Um, but when, when do we need to tackle the debt? Well, it's usually sooner than you think. So what people often think is that if we don't write the test and we don't do TDD and we don't do the refactoring, we'll go much faster. Because otherwise the developers are now going to have to do two things. They have to write the tests and they have to write the code. And actually they do three things. They also refactor the code. That's going to take much longer. Well, in the short term, it probably will take a bit longer. But in the long term, it won't because you'll actually have code that's readable and understandable and that you can actually change because you've designed it well. So very quickly, if you're just bashing on the keyboard and not writing any tests or doing any of that, you will end up with huge amounts of technical debt. But there's a final layer of technical debt which is also very common in our industry, which is now we know how we should have done it. Now, I, this is where I find um, the analogies to us being called software engineers or software architects kind of breaks down because when it comes to engineering and architecture, things are fairly stable. I like the ground that we're building this thing on, whether it's a bridge or a building, the materials that we're using, it's not like they change every six months. But in our world, everything <laughs> changes all the time. There was one point where there, I feel like there was a new JavaScript library every hour, a week, or by a month. It was just ridiculous. And I'm sure they all solve a problem. I'm just not sure which one. But my biggest problem is, is there's so many of them now. But things do change, right? The languages that we knew, use now, we won't use in the future. And I guess in the analogy of software engineer, sorry, as architecture or engineers, it, we'd be living in a world where like, the ground beneath us constantly change and the design constantly change halfway through. And we'd have some funky looking bridges, put it that way. But we do live in that world where things change all the time. So we do need to go back and make it better. One of the things that we discover in software is when it goes into production, how people actually use it. And then you might want to independently scale something differently, which will require not only refactoring, but probably some architectural restructuring as well. But there's always a bit of a pushback from the evil business side, who were like, why would I, why would I use my money to pay for you to fix your problems? Well, one of our biggest challenges when we talk to the business is we're often talking about quality, whether it be design quality or code quality, or we're talking about testing and technical debt reduction, and we talk about craftsmanship, and this is kind of what they hear. They just don't buy it because we're not talking to them in their language. When we talk about features versus quality, they're thinking about their business outcome versus your technical outcome. Now, I have to thank uh, Jim Fisher for this because he really helped us at ThoughtWorks think about things from the customer perspective and from the business perspective. He's like a translation engine when we're yelling about quality and refactoring. He's like, this is what you should actually say to them. You should talk about cycle time. They, they, they care about how quickly things go. You should talk about the fact that if we don't refactor and we don't clean up these balls of mud, we're going to go slower. Most systems that we build now do last quite a long time. And they are intended to last a long time. So it is a conversation you can have. And the other great thing is, is because we already have tons of balls of mud, these business people already have experience of things going over budget and over time when you are dealing with a ball of mud. So it's literally just like, hey, remember that other project? If we don't do this now, we're going to be there. Thank you. So now we get agreement from those business types that, oh yes, indeed, we do want to reduce the cycle time. That is a need of ours. How do we actually tackle these balls of mud? Well, there are many techniques out there that allow you to replace the monolith. First of all, you need to get some kind of test around it to make sure it doesn't break. And then you have two choices. 
you either do the big rewrite, which is like, it's completely unsavable, let's just rewrite it, or you rewrite it slowly, which is this idea of creating new modules and slowly dispatching code calls to new modules until you can eventually get rid of the old one. Now, two things about this. One, you should get rid of the old one. And two, don't just get stuck halfway through. I've been in organizations where they had three monoliths that did the same thing because they kept trying to rewrite it. And so basically when a user was using the system, there was calls like bouncing all over the place to various different monoliths. It was just insane. And it's because they kept going down this rewrite route but never really finishing what they were starting. So the idea here is you slowly but surely, piece by piece, break the thing apart. Now this is usually where people talk about microservices and get really excited. And I, uh, I caution them. The reason I caution them is because if you couldn't write modular code in a monolith, you should not be allowed to try and write modular code in a microservice. <laughs> Um, because you could write modular code in your monolith, that was actually possible. Um, and if you write code that isn't modular and that's coupled, poorly coupled, in a microservice, then you've got network issues. And that's not going to be fun for anybody, especially your operational folks. They don't like that. So how do you stop yourself from destroying the world again and rebuilding the monolith? Because we've all been here, you're like, it's a greenfield project. This time I'm going to write it in Clojure and it's going to be beautiful, it's going to be amazing and I've learned so much even though I've only been developing for five years. Anyway, the idea <laughs> is what you should be doing is thinking about modularity and thinking about coupling and cohesion. It's those old friends of ours that is the trick to writing clean software. And so when you do your refactoring as part of TDD, when you're re rewriting those new pieces, those new modular pieces, this is what you're thinking about. You're thinking about what are the right components. You can implement, th you can use tools like domain-driven design, and there's so much written out there about good coupling and poor coupling, and there's a lot to learn. But we are definitely in our infancy. But you can write modular code, and that's what you should be trying to do. Because it really does come to our old friends coupling and cohesion. Whether it's afferent or efferent coupling, this is the, how the ball of mud gets created. Coupling in the wrong places. Because you have to couple your system at some point. Even in the microservices land, whether it's you know, some kind of event-driven system, it's still kind of coupled. So you have to think about that. What's the best way to do that? And where are the good places to couple? And where are the poor places to couple? Because I basically translate balls of mud into inappropriate coupling in my head. But I'd be remiss when I talk about coupling and talk about balls of mud and talk about architecture not to talk about the people that cause the problem. Conway, Conway's law talks about the fact that your architecture will represent the structure of your teams, essentially. So if you want to go for a new architecture, you're probably going to have to redesign who works together. Because if you've got coupling problems, there's probably issues between the two teams that are coupled together. And they should probably have a conversation. And that's the people problem piece. It's not about the code. It's about who's talking to each other and who's not and how well they're working together and how well they are designing the system together. You are not enemies if somebody c <laughs> calls your API. They have a reason for doing that. You should have a conversation with them. Everybody, and I mean everybody, who is part of a software team, whether you are a product owner or a scrum master, you are in operations, you're a developer, you're a front-end developer, you're a back-end developer, everybody should be working towards the same goal. And that goal is to create high quality products that do not break when they go into production, either taking the system down with them or harming the users in any way. That is the goal of every single person on the team. And until you have that in mind and everybody understands that, and you have the discipline that goes with that, the discipline to write that software in that way, you will always have balls of mud. I will leave you with the wise words of Martin Fowler. He said, it isn't the methodologies that succeed or fail, it's the teams. Taking on a process can help a team raise its game, but in, ta in the end, 
It's the team that matters and carries the responsibility to do what works for them. Thank you.